how we can address the issue in its proper perspectives. Sometimes it may happen to compel a recalcitrant administration or government of the day to agree to some discussions or debate through a particular rule. And it leads ultimately to the disruptions. But the end result of the disruption is, to my mind, and as I, spent, as I said that I spent quite some time in Parliament, when I entered in late 60s and when I retired, incidentally it happened in the month of July, July 69 to July 2012, when my membership of Lok Sabha came to an end on the date of my election to president. That whether disruption puts any serious pressure on the government or it simply denies the rights of the individual members to express his views at the highest national decision-making body. Whether sometimes it provides advantage to the government because questions hour are the first victims of nowadays. And questions hour are being used by the members of the parliament, particularly the private members, more than often to put searching questions to the minister, not only to get information, but also to sometimes find out the contradiction in the policies of the government. Similarly, we talk of electoral reforms. We talk of how the institution should be strengthened. After all, any democratic system survives, becomes effective on the strength of its institutions. If we make a comparative study where the parliamentary form of democracy has become successful in neoliberated developing countries which got political emancipation after the Second World War, and where it has failed, perhaps one of the reasons, the countries where it failed, they failed to establish the relevant institutions to support the democratic structure. Institutions like independent judiciary, free press, <coughs> legislature and executive, though in parliamentary form they are one dependent on the other, but essentially, the legislature having total control over executive in respect of money, finance, taxation, and how these institutions could be made more effective. Again, I am drawing one example from my own experiences. When I entered into parliament in the late 60s and early 70s, we used to find very enumerated exhaustive discussions on budget, on finance bill. Financial transactions in those days were not of very high order. If I remember correctly, the first budget of independent India, total budgetary transactions, receipts and expenditure was 197 crores of rupees. 171 crore is the receipt, 197 crore was the expenditure divided between not so complicated plan, <laughs> revenue, capital, non-plan expenditure, very simple, military expenditure, civil expenditure, 96 crores was military expenditure and 101 crores was civil expenditure. Taxations were also very simple, income tax and customs. And for that, Parliament devoted a good deal of time. Size of the first plan was just 2,000 crores, which was introduced in 1951. And if anybody goes through the proceedings of Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha, they will find almost four days they debated on the approach paper of the plan. Then when the plan was finally adopted and in between, when the midterm appraisal of the plan was placed before the parliament. Today our budgetary transaction is more than 12 lakh crores of rupees. 
the eleventh plan which we have completed, and on the end of the twelfth plan, total plan outlay was more than 37 lakh crores of rupees, and it is for us to search ourselves how much justice we are doing to these huge budgetary transactions, financial transactions, over which nobody else except the elected members of the parliament and legislative assembly have exclusive control as per our constitution. No money can be spent from the consolidated fund of India except the authority of the law passed by parliament. No tax can be levied except by the law, authority of law passed by parliament. And no borrowing can be made, of course, there is no limit today, but Parliament has, Constitution has also provided that there should be a law to bring a ceiling on the borrowing. Through FRBM Acts, we are trying to bring some sort of discipline. But the short point which I am trying to drive at, that if we want to strengthen our democratic system, parliamentary form of democratic system, and now if I understand correctly, many eminent lawyers are also present here, that as per Supreme Court's ruling, parliamentary system of our <coughs> constitution is the basic structure of the constitution which cannot be amended, which cannot be altered. Therefore, how to make it strong? How to make it more effective? The third problem, the huge electorate. When the first election took place and when the 14th election to, uh, election to Lok Sabha took place, you compare what were the size of the electorate, and it is going to be more. You cannot go on increasing the size of the deliberative body <laughs> infinitely. Therefore, how to establish contact between the elector and the elected? What is the role of the third tier in the government? Whether the real devolution of power and authorities could be transferred in true sense of the term, so that the pressure on legislative assembly and finally on parliament are being limited to few subjects and few ideas. I have no really answer to all of these questions, but these questions are staring at our face. Apart from both what Mr. <coughs> Ram Srikilani and Malini has pointed out, that corruption, some sort of cynicism, which is entering into our system, how to address those issues. And I deeply appreciate the objective which they have stated in the small booklet which they have, they have given to us. They say that we'll function as a public policy resource outlet and not a journalistic uh, recourse. This should be. Three basic issues which you are going to take as your primary objective, that undertaking research on current topics, promotion dialogue and debate, and holding track two type roundtables on international issues and conflicts. This is very important in the sense. World has really emerged as a global village. And however we may wish, even if we desire so, we have no such intention, but even if we wish that we will remain in isolation, we cannot remain, because what happens in one part of the world must have its impact on us. Therefore, it is best how to address it. And if there is informed, structured debate, discussions, and final some view comes, it will be beneficial to all of us and it will be beneficial to the system. I sincerely thank the Hindu who has particularly Kasturi and Sons for 134 years they have served this great nation and our history of journalism goes side by side with our history of freedom struggle. The journalists, the newspapers, particularly like those of Hindu and many others, have contributed immensely in furthering our national cause, which ultimately brought independence, constitution, 
democracy and republic, and it is our responsibility to preserve that. In conclusion, I'd just like to quote one small observation of Benjamin Franklin, which he said while he was asked, he was one of the draftsmen of the USA Constitution. One lady asked him one day, will doctor we the women deliver child within 10 months? What you have delivered doctor for almost two and a half years? Dr. Benjamin Franklin's response was, a republic, provided you can keep it. Therefore, our forefathers have provided us with a republic, with constitution, with a democracy, and it is our responsibility to preserve that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the patience. Honorable Rashtrapati Ji, Mrs. Gandhi, Mr. Advani, Mr. Devagoda, distinguished leaders and guests, we at the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy could not have hoped for a better start with the highest office of the land being associated with the inauguration of a fledgling center and with the participation of leaders whose actions could shape the future and make a difference to the lives of the people. Together with this heady start comes the burden of expectations, even as we take small steps which we hope can contribute to the political discourse. With all your cooperation, we expect to explore solutions to long-standing problems, to turn the power of ideas into the utility of practice. We are most thankful to the Honorable Rashtrapati Ji for not just his presence and inspiring words, but for the gracious hospitality in this auditorium as well. The presence of the distinguished guests, Mrs. Gandhi, Mr. Advani, Mr. Devagauda, leaders in politics, industry, diplomats, leaders of culture, and the media, will be a source, source of inspiration for us as we begin this journey. We hope all our distinguished guests, the academics, and others would con continue to be generous with their time and involvement in our quest for contributing to the political discourse. We are most thankful to the staff of the Rashtrapati Bhavan Secretariat, Ms. Omita Paul, Mr. Venu Rajamani, Mr. Rajneesh, Group Captain Vidati, and other officials, and the staff of the Hindu Center and the Hindu, in particular, Dr. V. S. Samandhan, Ms. Mandira Modi, Ramanujam, and C.V. Balasubhamaniam, to designer Vivek Sani and his team, filmmaker Chetan Shah, who has produced a film for the Hindu Center, the eminent Carnatic musician Vidwan Sri T.M. Krishna, whose fortuitous presence in Delhi and gen generosity were tapped by us for the invocatory song, and all of whom have helped turn the Honorable President's generous hospitality into a most memorable event.